Hello, and welcome to Creative XR's opening keynote sessions. I'm Liz Rosenthal, executive producer of Creative XR, also known to many of you as curator of Venice VR, the immersive content section of Venice International Film Festival. I'm based out of London. For those of us working at the frontier of new technologies, we're used to having to adapt, update and refresh. But this year, more than ever, we've had to pivot our projects and businesses to entirely virtual versions. Although challenging, having to exist, work and play virtually has become a social norm for many of us. This means we've seen a huge acceleration in use cases for XR tools and platforms across the enterprise arts and entertainment sectors. That's exciting for all of us. And to help us navigate through these monumental changes and the key trends we've seen emerging over the last years, we'll be joined by two of the world's leading experts in immersive content. So I'm absolutely delighted and honored to introduce you to Kathy Hackle and Kent Bai. Kathy is a futurist author and globally recognized thought leader in immersive spatial computing and innovation. She's been named as one of the top 10 tech voices on LinkedIn for two years in a row and is frequently featured in leading media outlets such as Forbes Salon and VentureBeat. Kathy is joining us from Washington DC. Our other speaker is Kent Bai. He's one of the most prolific and respected journalists covering extended realities. His podcast, Voices of VR, launched in 2014, features over 1,000 interviews with pioneering artists, storytellers, curators, and technologists who are defining the sector. Kent is joining us from Portland, Oregon. Each of our speakers will give a 20 minute presentation. Kathy, focusing on industry trends and Kent on creative format trends. We're going to end with a short Q&A. So let's start with Kent. Okay, so uh, my name is Kent Bai and today I'm gonna be talking about the revealing of character through interactive storytelling. Uh, I had a chance to watch through all the different videos of the cohort for the Creative XR and I was trying to really boil down like the essence of what's it mean to have interactive media and to try to get at the, a deeper level of what this is all about. So that's what we'll be talking about today. So uh, I've been doing the Voices of VR podcast since 2014 and uh, taking a real interest of the future of immersive storytelling. So I think it's the, the storytellers that are really pushing the medium forward. Uh, so there's this quote from Robert McKee says, uh, the true character is revealed uh, in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. So I'll be kind of unpacking this throughout the course of this talk to really look at what's it mean to make choices, uh, being in context of pressure, as well as uh, revealing of your true essential character, uh, whether it's your character or the character of the story that you're trying to tell. So uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the communications medium as a process. So we have new technologies like virtual and emerging, uh, virtual augmented reality, artificial intelligence, whatever the new technology is. And then it gets into the hands of artists who try to explore the affordances of what that technology can do. They make art and try to push the limits and um, really e explore and experiment. And then you have distribution channels uh, for that work that are really getting that, that art into the hands of an audience who watches the work and then has this feedback loop cycle that then changes how the technology evolves and develops as well as what the artists are creating. And I think as we look at this loop of the communications medium as a process, what we can see is that with COVID-19 and this global pandemic, it's totally disrupted a lot of the artistic distribution channels, whether it's the immersive film festivals or location-based entertainment or museums. Because we have social distancing and a lot of things are shut down, that means that artists are in this space have to start to think about, okay, if, if we don't have a vaccine for a long time, then how can I do this remotely? How can we start to use the emerging technologies that are available? Can't use a lot of really fancy haptics or installations. Or if you are gonna do that, then you have to have a lot of very specific um, safety protocols. So that's just something to think about as I'm watched through all the different um, uh, presentations that this is obviously gonna be a big part of this distribution channel being disrupted and there's new distribution channels that are being cultivated right now. All right, so the big bulk of this talk here, I'm gonna be talking about the, the four dimensions of experience, the lens of quality, context, story, and character. 
So as I've been going to all these different uh, immersive film festivals, Sundance, South by Southwest, Tribeca, if a doc lab, the Venice virtual reality conference, I get to see a lot of the cutting edge of what's happening out there. And having been going to this for the last three or four years and, you know, seeing pretty much every time I go to a conference, see all the different selections, then I start to try to, uh, uh, take my own phenomenological experiences and do like a sense-making framework uh, through looking at the quality context story and character. So let's first look at the, the quality of the experience. So this is everything from uh, the active presence, the mental and social presence, the emotional presence, and the embodied and, envir <clears throat> embodied and environmental presence. I think it's important to, to note that all of these are all happening all at the same time and that there's inherent trade-offs for each of these. And we can start to think about this in another way by looking at existing communications media. Um, so we have, in terms of active presence, we have like video games. So expressing your will and you know uh, locomoting and moving and taking action within an experience. And then there's the mental and social presence, which is a lot of the different abstractions of language and communication, as well as interacting with other people, uh, but also the more literary uh, forms of, of storytelling through like literature and books. So we have books, we have the internet and your phone, which are all kind of ways in which that we're interfacing with the communications networks and the World Wide Web and more the mental and social presence dimension. And then we have the uh, emotional presence, which is uh, film is like the, the center of gravity there where film is really trying to build and release different tension. And it has these consonants and dissonance cycles that really give you this sense of time, but it's ultimately uh, modulating your emotions through the cutting, the pacing, the, the lighting, and as well as a lot of the, the music. And then finally, we have the embodied and environmental presence. And this is where we have all of our sensory experiences, uh, um, our five senses, uh, that are being hijacked and hacked by virtual and augmented reality. We also have traditional mediums like theater and architecture and dance. And so one of the things that I see is happening overall within the industry is each of these communications mediums from game design to web design to cinematic storytelling to architecture and theater and dance and uh, immersive uh, theater and uh, just contemplative dance. All of these different uh, design disciplines are unique, but yet VR and augmented reality, they're blending them all together. So that's what I see as I watch through the cohort, all the different um, videos, You, a lot of people are sort of adding in theater to uh, this aspect and trying to blend in the immersive storytelling aspects uh, with like haptics. And, and so it's this continued evolution of trying to figure out what is this sort of master design framework to sort of fuse all these things together. So in essence, it's you know making choices, taking action, the sense of emotional immersion, and your sensory experience. Okay, so that's the the quality of the experience. Now the context of the experience, I think, is uh, unique to virtual and augmented reality because uh, while VR is able to completely transport you to a different context, AR is a lot about you are in an existing context and you're adding new information into your context that's slightly modulating your context or potentially even completely changing your context. And so there's a blurring of context that's happening. So there's a number of different ways I start to think about context. Um, context is something that's not well-defined. Um, you know, when I ask people what the ultimate potential of VR is, people tend to answer like, well, it's entertainment, medicine, uh, higher education, your career, connecting with friends and family, expression of your identity, uh, you know, being able to communicate and, uh, and also just, you know, the sense of, of home and family. So you have all these different domains of human experience, which are essentially different contexts. And one of the things that VR, again, is doing is sort of blurring all these contexts together or allowing you to completely shift your context by taking you into someone's world. Uh, now, when I look at different ethical and moral issues, uh, the context helps to map out a lot of the different ethical and moral dilemmas. So as an example, like biometric data in the context of you know, uh, surveillance capitalism. So what's it mean for companies to have access to all this really intimate information to potentially uh, you know, psychographically profile you and sell you ads? And so we have lots of medical information and all these different contexts that, again, are all being kind of blurred together. So ethics is a good lens to be able to really understand uh, the, the different domains of human experience. And I've explored that in other talks like the XR Ethical Manifesto that really dives into the ethical issues. But um, from that, I sort of came up with these different buckets and, and each of these are, are kind of 
uh, you know, Girdle has the, uh, this um, incompleteness theorem where you can either choose consistency or completeness, but you can't have both. And so uh, while I try to create this sort of uh, complete framework, it, there's going to be inconsistencies and there's always going to be things that are not necessarily included. So the point is not to be totally complete or consistent. It's more to use at least some framework to help understand some of the inherent trade-offs or uh, aspects and um, affordances that come with immersive technologies. Um, I did a talk recently uh, going into all the different uh, college majors and to what degree are the are there uh, pioneers and early adopters of immersive technologies? What are the kind of early movers, so the early majority, and then who are the, the late majority and the laggards? And so as I start to map these out, I can sort of map these into these different contexts and see that, well, there's education and communication is, you know, got some green here. There's also the entertainment is actually, you know, one of the biggest areas. And when I look at a lot of the creative XR pieces that it comes into this entertainment bucket, but there's also the things about medical applications that I'm starting to see even in creative XR, but also the sense of home and family and the architecture. And so really looking at how to tell the story of a place and, and doing uh, volumetric capture of locations. Um, and so when I look at all these different contexts, then I think it's uh, important to see that that's a real affordance of VR. And I, I want to just dive in and, and unpack this a little bit more with The Book of Distance, which if people haven't seen it, it's one of the most amazing immersive storytelling experiences that I've seen so far. I think part of what makes this experience so powerful is that it's telling a very personal narrative, but you are being transported into these different contexts of this uh, Japanese family that's immigrating from Japan into Canada. And you get, uh, you, they have, there's different embodied interactions in a wide range of different contexts. So let's just kind of like walk through, this is kind of like a high level overview. Um, and I'll come back to this slide at the end to kind of like tie it together, but let's just kind of walk through this step-by-step. Step. So you kind of start off where it's kind of blending into this immersive theater context where uh, you have uh, Randall who's kind of telling the story of his father and he's showing, you know, his, his father's living room there. So he's kind of blurring in his father's home context, but you're also within an immersive theater context. And then you move into the context of the home uh, in, in Japan, what that was like, and then this long distance travel and going into a new world. So you get onto the ship, you wave goodbye. And then you go into uh, this process of building the log cabin, but also farming. Um, and so this is the new life they have within uh, Vancouver. And you're actually like in invited to help do the chores. And so you feel like you're actually a part of this family, a part of this community as you're embedded into this context and do these actions where the actions are actually like uh, reinforcing the narrative that they're telling. Uh, and then, you know, this is, you know, the turn where the government comes in and, you know, it, it's, uh, they're starting to uh, take and um, put these uh, Japanese in internment camps uh, during the World War uh, II. And so with that, then they get tra uh, transported, um, kind of being put into exile. Uh, and then from exile, they're put into prison in these different internment camps. Uh, and then at the end, they come back and, and just sort of like go through the memories. And so you get back into this kind of immersive theater context where they're, you see the, the two main characters kind of talking to each other. So as you map this out, you can see that there's the home and family, both from the original home and the, the new home. You have the immersive theater context where it's sort of a book ended at the beginning and end. You have the, the travel, um, you have their career, which is like they're working on the farm, but there's also the government institutions are coming in into their home and then they're, they're putting them into exile. So as you can see, like you're able to go and really be immersed in each of these different contexts. And I think that's one of the things that I really see is the power of VR. And a big trend that I see is this exploration of context in this very specific way. I wanted to also just uh, call out one of the, the experiences that I saw that I think is a good example of this, which is the austerity on trial, which you start to look at how you're talking about homelessness, but you're putting that within the context of the judges that are actually kind of a metaphor for where the laws are being made. And so uh, the Congress and the, this sort of uh, um, court room where you have all these people that are suffering from these policy decisions. And so you're actually taking something that's normally within the public context of some, you know, being homeless, but putting it within the government institutions and this augmented reality experience. And so this is a really good example of blurring these different contexts of someone's home and the, the pain and suffering that they're going through with their medical conditions, but within the context of these courtrooms. So that's the context. Uh, moving on to story. So 
as we think about story, story is like this unfolding process where there's like a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, you you are at, at some sort of uh, normal middle uh, where this uh, you get call into. Uh, there's like a baseline of mundane reality that then you cross into a threshold of the unknown where you you get put through all these different trials and tribulations. <clears throat> and then eventually, once you uh, su su uh, successfully accomplish the, the mission of whatever that is, then you have this return where you're coming back with all the, the lessons that you have. So there's this process that happens within you know storytelling. And then if you want to look at this and kind of break it down between uh, the interactive stories, the authored stories and interactive stories. So we have the spectrum of, of story authorship. On one extreme here on the left, we have the authored narrative. That's where you as a viewer have no agency or impact on the story. No matter what you do, the story is going to be the same. It's essentially like watching a film where whatever you do, you may be going through lots of different emotional turmoil while watching it, but that emotional turmoil is not being fed back and changing the narrative at all. And then you have on the other extreme, the generative narrative, that's where you have like the maximum amount of agency and expression of your will. Now, it's not like a total uh, agency, total free will. There's always some sort of fadedness and some sort of authoredness and boundedness. So, you know, this gets into like more philosophical debates of the, the you know, uh, fate and free will, because there's always some sort of like mix of that fate and free will. But you think about this other extreme where you're really trying to maximize for people expressing their will and their agency within an experience. So Lubinitz, Lubinitz and Klug have this interactive storytelling spectrum where they have this, you know, uh, they try to uh, lay out different types of stories. And I'll, I'll go through and kind of uh, show you the structure of this full spectrum. So you have the fully traditional stories. That's the three-act structure, you know, the you know, Aristotelian way of uh, the building and releasing of the tension. You know, we're all familiar with this kind of three-act structure. Uh, and then you have the uh, interactive traditional story. That's where you start to give like little illusions of agency, but yet uh, at the end of the day, you still kind of like uh, coalesce into one single ending. And so you're going to get flavors of a story, but yet uh, near the end, you kind of end up at the same spot. And I think a, a lot of different interactive stories use this kind of type of narrative. And then the branching path stories, that's where you get in the middle of authored narrative and generative narrative, where you're, you're basically have this exponential creation of all the different stories. And it, it takes the most amount of labor to be able to create all these different narrative arcs and to make sure that each of them makes sense. And as you go through it, you're only going to see a fraction of that work that has been done. And then you have like the interactive drama manager, something like Facade, where you record a lot of different dialogue pairs and then you, you have the agency to be able to move around in a game like Facade. Uh, but depending on what your actions are, that drives what narrative you get at any given moment. And so there's like an interactive drama manager that's paying attention to what you're doing. And so it's delivering you the most quality narrative that you can get. But then once you sort of start to move further along, you get into more open-ended stories and it becomes more of an open-ended sandbox that becomes less about the uh, narrative uh, story that's being authored and it becomes more about exploring a world and uh, seeing more of an object-oriented uh, approach where you're looking at objects and seeing what the stories are. Or, um, you know, eventually you get into this fully player-driven story where it's more about creating a probability space uh, and, and characters <clears throat> that um, rather than specific storylines, more characters and personalities and uh, specific archetypal experiences that you may want to have someone have. And again, this is more optimized for the, the, the expression of someone's agency and will. So again, this is the, the spectrum of interactive storytelling. So uh, that's the story aspect. And I'm going to uh, uh, kind of conclude here by, by doing a little bit of a, a deep dive into the character aspects, because I'm just going to come back to this quote here, which is that the character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. So as you go through and you put put into these different contexts and put under pressure and be forced to make actions, those actions and those choices that you're taking are in some way revealing your character. So uh, whose character is being revealed? Well, it kind of depends on where you fall on this uh, spectrum. If it's an authored narrative, then it's whatever the character of the person, place, of thing. So it's like the event, the person, the culture, or the place that you're really focusing on. Uh, that's like whatever you're focusing to tell the story on. Now, the other extreme, the generative narrative, uh, the audience member, uh, you become the character. So it becomes about your character being revealed. So what does it mean to go into an immersive experience that reveals some essential part of your character? I think that's that's a really difficult thing to really accomplish, but I've, I've certainly seen that, and I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit more here. 
Um, but first, I want to talk about this: these two different decisions. You have to either decide whether or not you're going to be a ghost or an embodied character within your experience, or if you have impact or no impact. And so, you kind of have this. Uh, this is a, a talk, an interview I did with um, back in episode 293 uh, with uh, Dolan, um, and he talks about like the ghost without impact. So that's like sleep no more. You're going in, you're kind of a ghost with a mask on. You have no agency within this experience at all. No matter what you do, it's going to be the exact same. The other end is like my UB. So uh, Felix and Paul, where you're being addressed in a 360 video as a robot, but um, so you're a character, but no matter what you do, you, you can't really impact it. It's you're kind of still on rails. So even though you're being addressed as a character, you can't do anything. And then a ghost with impact is like agents where you're kind of controlling these as an omniscient God, you're controlling what happens to these AI bots and you're kind of seeing these generative stories unfold. Uh, so you're not really seen and you're not really, I mean, in some sense you're a character, but you don't have any, like you're not addressed or you're kind of invisible and omniscient in this piece. Uh, and you kind of see how you're able to drive these different uh, conclusions. And I'd say probably the pinnacle of having a character with impact is facade where you're doing these natural uh, uh, interaction, these dialogue, uh, natural language interactions with these two characters. And depending on the relationship that you've built with them, it kind of splits off into five different endings, uh, but it has different branches as you go along. And so at each moment, whatever you're doing is driving the outcome of that story. Okay. So it, sort of a nutshell, we have uh, this formula, which is like you have a protagonist that's placed within a context that's put under pressure. And so the protagonist is either you or it's the characters that you're featuring. And that pressure is the story that's unfolding. So whatever dynamics that are unfolding and changing. And then there's uh, making choices and taking action. And then as you make choices and take action, then some sort of part of your essential character is revealed. And I think this is uh, just briefly just talking about the collider where this is an experience where it's really exploring your boundaries uh, around uh, power as well as um, uh, your, your personal boundaries around uh, you know, what degree that you have power over some other people or people have power over you. Uh, and this was an experience that was really profound for me because I think I, I had a chance to do it twice. And as I went through it and, and saw both lenses uh, from both perspectives, I started to see what the common threads were with my own sort of essential nature for how I relate to power and the, how I relate to different boundaries. And so as you go through these uh, different situations where you're presented with different opportunities, poten potentially uh, transgress different boundaries and have power over people and in a, in a sort of an ethically questionable way, that is a lot of high stakes pressure that actually can reveal a, a key part of your own character. And I think that's a good example of, of what I mean by you know, uh, the, the true essence of revealing character. So there's lots of different ways of talking about the character, whether it's the unconscious, the conscious, you know, the more depth psychological union approach of talking about the, your, your character. It could be moral virtue as character. So all these different uh, moral virtues, uh, you can look at the virtual continuum, um, you know, Westworld, they have a whole spectrum of all these different aspects of uh, each of the characters um, and how they modulate the different personalities. You have character temperament is another way of looking at character. You have a big five personality traits. You have uh, feelings and needs of each of these characters. So again, whatever way that you talk about character or think about character, uh, I think these interactive stories are all about a protagonist being placed in a context, being put under pressure, they're making choices and taking action. And then at the end, you have some sort of essential character that's being revealed. So uh, in conclusion, just uh, today, I just were talking a little bit about the communications being as a process and then the, these four dimensions of the experience, the quality of the experience, context of experience, story and experience, and the character of the experience. So that's all that I have. So thank you. Thanks so much, Kent. That was a fantastic presentation. It was amazing what you packed into 20 minutes. Um, and we're going to bring you back after Kathy's presentation. So welcome, Kathy. Right. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of Creative, the Creative XR Showcase. I'm excited to be here to talk to you guys about uh, some of the trends, uh, as well as some of the projects that I'm working on. And my presentation is actually called The Printing Press of the Future, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but I did want to start by sharing some information on how it all began for me in the industry. Uh, because I think um, it might help inspire a few of the creatives that are here or a few of the people that might be watching that are thinking of how can I get involved or how can I enter the industry. And I'll kind of take you take you um, through through my personal narrative of where it all began and where I'm going and some of the projects and, uh, and trends that I'm seeing. So uh, my first big break in virtual reality actually came uh, when I was uh, 
I was hired to be the chief communications officer for Future Lighthouse. So Future Lighthouse was a small cinematic VR studio out of Madrid with offices in LA. Uh, we worked in, on amazing, truly groundbreaking projects for the time uh, on experiences with Oculus like Melita, which some of you guys might've experienced, which is just a beautiful story. Uh, also with, um, with Oculus, we did something called a, a Campfire Creepers. Uh, which was one of the first uh, horror cinematic horror um, episodic uh, content. And it, we actually got a chance to film with Robert Englund. Uh, so if that rings a bell, that's Freddy Krueger. And <laughs> so we did a whole horror series. Um, one episode was done with him. He was not Freddy Krueger, but it was a really exciting thing. And um, this was my first big break. I worked in this creative studio. Um, and one of the things that I found interesting was that we were way ahead of our time. We were creating amazing content that truly inspired. And um, sadly, like many other startups, uh, we weren't able to raise the funds to keep going, but the content lives on. And I just kind of want to show a little bit of, of, of the mindset that we had at Future Lighthouse. And I, I'll kind of explain why I'm showing this a little bit later, but I'm going to go ahead. Storytelling has defined who we are as human beings for hundreds of centuries, and it has always been somehow linked with technology. What if we had invented the most powerful storytelling tool to date? Something so technologically advanced that it was almost indistinguishable from magic. Hay historias que solamente se pueden contar en cine, que se pueden contar en videojuegos o que se pueden contar en una obra de teatro. Historias que solamente se pueden cantar y hay otras historias que se pueden contar en realidad virtual y solo tienen sentido si las cuentas en este medio. At Future Lighthouse, we are crafting some of the most compelling narratives ever created. And we are using all these incredible tools that we have in our hands to do. Creamos contenido con diferentes técnicas. Por ejemplo, utilizamos video de imagen real con actores en estereoscopía. A veces metemos una capa de efectos digitales con fotogrametría. Y otras veces creamos el contenido directamente en 3D en tiempo real. It doesn't really matter how many years of experience you have because we learn new things every day. It's like resetting everything you know and starting from scratch. The viewer is no longer constrained in VR and we really need to understand that as filmmakers. Uh, Sphere is our new arena. We don't frame anymore. We build worlds, story worlds. I think a lot of you that are probably, probably watch this video might identify yourself with those challenges of really, really telling stories in a completely different medium, uh, changing the narrative, changing the way people experience these stories and creating creating worlds. We are really world builders. I, um, I wanted to show you this because I'm also a mom to three children and uh, they are world builders in reality. They spend a lot of their time in Minecraft or in Roblox creating these worlds. So I think that there's a lot here for us to to kind of take on when we think about what is coming next. Um, so how it's going right now, um, I'm actually very, uh, very lucky uh, to be uh, part of the Television Academy, the Television Academy here in the United States, which gives out the Emmy Awards. Um, and I'm part of the executive committee for the Interactive Media Peer Group. Uh, what that means is that the committee that I'm a part of is in charge of uh, selecting and giving the se several awards. And one of them is the Outstanding Innovation in Interactive Media, uh, which this year went to the line, um, an experience that actually used hand tracking in Oculus Quest. And it was a beautiful story uh, about 1960s Brazil. Um, so it, so the, the reason I'm sharing this is because I want you to know that these type, this type of content, whether it's created in Brazil, whether it's created in the UK, whether it's created, you know, um, anywhere in the US, uh, can actually come in, you know, eventually be um, submitted for an Emmy. And the creativity that we're starting to see and the amount of, uh, of just amazing storytelling that's coming is, is truly beautiful. And I kind of want to just urge you to think outside and, and to think about, you know, what are what are the places that you want your your content to be highlighted and how do you want to compete? Um, so very, very excited to be part of this group that actually makes some of, some of these decisions. Um, but I kind of want to really start the story with, um, with a visit to the Library of Congress in the United States. So if you've ever been to the US or came at some point, you might have come to DC where I'm based. Um, in the Library of Congress, we actually have a picture, well, a copy, sorry, this is, this is the picture, a copy. Um, a, we have a Gutenberg Bible, one of the Gutenberg Bible, Bibles. And um, 
it, they have it here. And when I went to the Library of Congress, I started thinking through the implications of the printing press for society and how impactful it was. And that's obviously no one debates that it was massively important to society. But when I was standing there in front of it, uh, looking at it and taking a picture, I started to think about what is it that we're doing with VR, AR, volumetric video and all these technologies. And I came to the conclusion that we are working, we are all working and we're all creating the printing press of the future whether it's, like I said, virtual reality, augmented reality, spatial computing, volumetric video, um, spatial audio, all these things that we're starting to do are truly work in the printing press of the future. So I come to you in some way as a futurist as well to share that insight and to say that the work that you're doing is extremely valuable. And the work that you're doing is truly about telling stories, you know, about telling stories that need to live on creating new stories and how are we going to be able to share that content and share that moving forward. Um, when I was at Magic Leap most recently, I had a chance to work on a really interesting project with the Smithsonian Institution here in the United States. Um, it was uh, pretty much bringing what's called the Cosmic Buddha into spatial computing. So for context, the Cosmic Buddha is a stone sculpture uh, from China for many, 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 many uh, centuries ago. And um, it is one of the first pieces that the Smithsonian actually scanned in 3D. Uh, so when they started doing 3D scanning for historical preservation, um, this is one of the first pieces that they uh, that they worked with. And we were able to partner with them and kind of uh, look at the idea of how do we bring this important um, historical piece, his heritage, uh, part, of, part of heritage from China into spatial computing. Um, we worked with them on a proof of concept app that would allow multiple students and teachers to view the 3D model um, you know, from anywhere in the world in real time. We thought that was really exciting. Uh, the part where I was involved was actually creating a behind the scenes video uh, showing how this um, how this actually was uh, brought to life and created. And when I was doing this behind the scenes video about it, um, I came across uh, an amazing community of people working. And, and these are images that kind of showcase the cosmic Buddha. And for example, that's the 3D model, but with through spatial computing, you're actually able to get closer to it and actually highlight some of the many intrinsic carvings it had. So just a, a beautiful piece of history um, that needs to be preserved. And when I was doing this interviews for this behind the scenes, I came across a community of people that are working in 3D, 3D scanning for heritage purposes. And I got into a conversation with Dr. Lori Collins from the University of South Florida. And she said, and you can read it here, she said that heritage and history are vanishing. She sees them as an endangered species. And if we don't have that digital surrogate of these historical um, artifacts, we're gonna lose those stories. Right, so we started to think through and talk about what you know, what is it that we're doing with VR and AR? We're telling stories, but there's there's also a bigger purpose. We're really creating the libraries and the museums of the future. You know, we, we need to start seeing libraries and museums as the repositories of 3D content, of preserving stories, artifacts, heritage for the future. And whether it's whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, I think it's extremely powerful to start looking at what we're doing in this sense. And this actually led me into a project that I'm working on right now uh, with a, uh, a team at, uh, here in the US and DC and a team in Costa Rica um, to highlight the, the date and the moment that Costa Rica abolished its army. And the reason I'm working on this project is because I am Costa Rican. So if you know anything about Costa Rica, you probably have heard of the rainforest and all the wonderful things, but Costa Rica actually has no army. It was abolished on December 1st, 1948. Um, and all the money that would have gone into an army, it actually goes into education and conservation and a lot of different efforts. So when I got involved in this project um, to showcase the anniversary of the abolishment of uh, the Costa Rican army, um, we started walking through what is the process? What is the story here? How do we bring people the younger people who might not even think the story is relevant to their life, but is very much important into this experience. So um, I've been working with this team in Costa Rica with this, for this experience called El 48, which means 1948, 48, um, taking people through an experience in the place where the army was abolished, 
um, through dungeons and, and a lot of different experiences. And when we're when we're crafting this, you know, um, this the story and bringing the story back to life, we start to think through how do we have people follow the story and make sure that they're staying, you know, staying uh, connected to the story. And one of the things that we actually came up with was the hummingbird. This little hummingbird, if you ever get a chance to do this experience, which is not out yet, um, you know, you actually follow this little hummingbird, which is very representative of Costa Rica, very representative of peace through the experience. And it actually leads you through through everything from being in prison all the way up to when you actually uh, get to knock down a wall, which is a very symbolic moment when the Costa Rican army was abolished. And when I was working on this project, something happened. Um, I started to talk to the team that was working on this. And the woman that used to be the first lady of Costa Rica when the army was abolished, uh, her name was Henrietta Boggs and she was alive at the moment when we were working on this. Uh, we said, we need to volumetrically scan her. We need to create a hologram of her to have, be, have that be part of the experience because we wanna preserve her experience. She's called, she's sometimes referred as the first lady of the revolution in Costa Rica. And she's a very important historical person, even though she was American, she was the first lady in Costa Rica. And what happened here was that we were planning to get her volumetrically scanned at Avatar Dimension, a studio that is here up here in, in Washington, DC. We were planning to get her up here. Uh, we're working everything on everything, all the you know logistics during coronavirus to get her up here. She was 120 two and a half years old. And what happened here was that we were planning that and she got coronavirus and actually passed away. So what that what happened at that moment when when that happened was a lot of sadness, but a lot of urgency, especially for me in the next project that I'm working on. And I'll explain that a little bit further, but it is a race against time to be able to capture some of these stories. So now the projects that I'm working on are really interesting and they're more around volumetric video or holograms. I mean, the holograms is not really the right term, but most of the people, the, the term they're gonna use is hologram, um, but volumetric video and how do we, you know, how do we bring some of, um, some of these creations to life? And I started working with Avatar Dimension and I thought it was actually quite symbolic that for some reason uh, they also use the hummingbird. So I saw that as kind of this, on, in my own personal narrative, a flow from the project that I was doing here that led me to, uh, to want to try to scan a historical figure to working with Avatar Dimension. And we're doing a lot of really interesting projects here with holograms. Um, one that we recently did, and this is a, an image of our temporary sage. Uh, one of the ones that we recently did was with the Center of Creative Arts in St. Louis here in the United States. Uh, they have a new space, beautiful new space that haven't really been able to uh, have people come through it because of coronavirus. So they wanted to kind of make sure that they were able to welcome society, welcome their community, make sure community was, you know, aware that they were there and kind of connect with them in a different way. So um, I'll show you just the two quick little videos of the project that we did with them where we incorporated these volumetric scans into websites. Hello and welcome to COCA the Center of Creative Arts. I'm Kelly Pollack, COCA's Executive Director. Well, actually, I'm Kelly's hologram, and it's my pleasure to offer you the sneak peek of COCA's beautiful expanded facility. And this is another example of the project we with them. Hi, I'm Jennifer Winsor, Artistic Director of Theater at COCA, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the stunning Catherine B. Burgess Theater. Whether it's aspiring students or national artists, in this house of the people, multi-generational audiences will enjoy some of the most inspiring performances from around the country. So I want you to kind of just look at this and, and think about what if we replace Hi. this hologram with a historical figure. And um, basically what I'm working on, and I'm truly excited to be sharing this, is I'm working with Avatar Dimension to create um, a volumetric video historical preservation program because we see the need to preserve heritage and history. Um, everything, you know, I think just the whole story of how I arrived at this opportunity to create this program has been amazing because it is a race against time, whether it's stories from the Holocaust, whether it's stories from other countries, uh, whether it's dances 
um, that you know that might uh, might leave us when the last person that knows it uh, you know passes away. Whether it's a language, whether it's artifacts, I think it's incredibly important to start to think through if we are the printing press of the future, if we are working uh, towards the printing press of the future, what role do our technologies play in, pres in preserving these stories? And I think that that's where I'm excited for volumetric video and the Greek word for hollows means whole and for grandma means painting. Um, and I think that that's just a, a, an exciting moment to think through how can you use volumetric video for historical preservation? Um, so this is a program that I'm currently working on right now um, in, you know, I wouldn't say it's the world's first because there's actually been great work done out of US, out of US, 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 UCF, I think in California, um, with preserving Holocaust survivor stories. And that's something we want to look at. We want to look at political figures. We want to look at historical figures and kind of preserve those stories so that in the future, whenever we do break out from, you know, from our screens, from these screens, from the rectangles that we're looking at or from the rectangles in our hands and content is seen through glasses or through contact lenses, um, that it is actually volumetric and that we have those historical pieces preserved for the future. So this is just a program that I'm I'm just so truly excited to be a part of, and I hope will inspire many of you creatives that are out there and thinking through, um, and through what is the future of memories? What is the future of stories? If we're working in these mediums, what is the bigger purpose of what we're creating? Um, so before I before I um, I leave you, I also kind of want to share some of the things that I'm I'm seeing that are related to to the efforts that I'm working on from a volumetric video standpoint and from a uh, a VR standpoint, and I get a chance to actually write for Forbes as a contributor. I am not a journalist. I know Kent, Kent is a journalist. I'm not a journalist. I have not been a journalist for, for many years. I'm more of a contributor and, and, um, and, and, and write for them. Uh, I, I tend to write very futuristic uh, pieces, exploring uh, what's coming down the line. And one of the things that I'm currently seeing a lot of interest in, uh, it is related to those world build, to that world building, to those storytellers, uh, and to my children is the idea and the concept that we're moving away from the, not moving away, but the direct to avatar is becoming the next direct to consumer. And I think that this is really impactful for all of us working in the industry, whether we're telling stories or, you know, or creating holograms or whatever it is that we're doing in, in, in the industry. And I arrived at this in many different ways, but one of the reasons I arrived at this was because I started to notice something. Uh, when I was growing up, my brother was saving up to buy Air Jordans. That's what he wanted. He wanted a pair of Air Jordans. So when there was something important, he would ask for money and he would save it to buy Air Jordans. Uh, my son recently had a, an important celebrate, you know, important moment in his life, and we had a celebration. And I came to ask him, and I said, um, "What do you want? You know, what do you want as a gift?" And he said, "Mom, I don't want money." I want you to get me a Roblox gift card. Roblox is, to me, it's a video game. To them, it's a community. Uh, said, I want you to get me a Roblox gift card that I can, I can actually uh, turn into Robux, which is the digital currency inside the video game, to buy my favorite gamer skin. And um, that, to me, was a big signal of kind of this shift that's slowly happening in from direct to consumer to direct to avatar. And it has a lot of implications for people in gaming and people in VR and AR. And then I think the biggest and most thing, most important thing that I'm excited about from a future perspective is the coming of the metaverse, the enablement of the metaverse that is being worked on. And I, I wrote this article in uh, in the summer uh, for Forbes, and it's it's gotten a lot of traction, a lot of great uh, reviews and feedback from people reaching out saying, "I understand now what you mean by the coming of the metaverse." Um, so everyone here, you know we're all working towards some type of merging of the digital and the physical and an exciting time for us to be uh, to be creating these stories and to be, um, you know, and to be kind of figuring out where we fit in this whole printing press of the future journey that we're all going on. And, you know, and don't take it from me. I mean, take it from Wired Magazine, take it from all, all the companies that are investing in, in, in what's coming. Uh, there was actually some recent stories about Niantic and the work they're doing to enable this metaverse or AR cloud or mirror world or whatever word you're, you're, uh, you would want to use, use, but this is incredibly important. Um, so now I kind of, before I leave you, I kind of want to share a little bit about where I'm going. Uh, in my own journey. I am currently here in the United States. And one of the things that I'm looking at is actually uh, spending a lot more time in, um, in policy as we move forward. I think that um, there's a lot of important things and conversations that need to happen related to ethics 
and policy. I'm actually starting a program at Harvard uh, Kennedy School uh, on policy and technology. Um, I've been very lucky to be able to go to Capitol Hill and start to have conversations. Obviously, this is you know, pre-pandemic, but go to Capitol Hill here in the United States and start to have conversations with people on Capitol Hill, whether it is the Reality Caucus, which is here, or giving, you know, demos to high-ranking members, but being able to start those conversations. And um, that's kind of where I see myself heading, is having more of that impact in thinking through what are the considerations that we need to have from an ethics, privacy, and policy perspective. And I know Kent recently did a fantastic interview with one of the heads of privacy um, at, uh, at Facebook that I, would, I highly recommend everyone go to Kent's uh, podcast and listen to that. That was brilliant. But for me, um, I'm not only working on historical preservation, but I'm also trying to work at the intersection of, uh, of what XR and the metaverse and policy um, will, will look like. So just the, you know, kind of wanted to share that because it's kind of fairly new in my journey and where I'm going as we get into this era of the metaverse and as we continue to realize that we are working and we are creating the printing press of the future. So I wanted to thank you for allowing me to share this information with you and feel free to connect with me if you're interested in learning about any of the projects that I mentioned. Uh, for, El, for El 48, you can go to Spark Media and for Avatar Dimension, um, you can, you know, look at avatardimension.com. Thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so I'm going to bring both of you um, into discussion now. Great. So we're now going to have a 15 minute Q&A. Thanks both for your fantastic presentations. So I want to go back to some of those points you raised um, around the metaverse and digital avatars first. Um, so I've noticed that social virtual, virtual worlds, which um, I see the sort of current term for the metaverse or different metaverses are one of the areas we've seen a huge acceleration in over the last um, months um, since uh, the pandemic started. Um, so we've seen uses uh, with music festivals, we've seen VR uh, festivals, uh, we've seen live immersive performances and games. So how important do you feel these would be for the arts in the future? Do you think this is something that's going to just um, accelerate um, even further? And can you point us towards some of your favourite virtual worlds and experiences that you've seen this year? So I'll start with Cathy. Okay. Um, I think it's going to keep accelerating, even, even in the future when we get back to some level of whatever normal will be in the future, right? I still think these experiences will continue to accelerate. Um, I, I, you know, I, I try to spend a lot of time in social VR with friends, especially during the pandemic. It's been exciting. I, I've actually been a beta tester for Facebook Horizon which is their social VR platform. And I've spent a lot of time there um, building some worlds. Uh, I, it's interesting because in, in, some, in some way, shape or form many years ago, I would have never considered myself a world builder, but now I'm in there building a world, right? Um, so I think a lot more people are gonna kind of be able to access those types of uh, you know, experiences and those types of tools and start creating their own, their own little places in the, you know, in the metaverse. Um, you know, and I know Kent, Kent also experienced this, but uh, Burning Man VR, uh, so the Burning Man camp in virtual reality was exciting. Uh, you had tons of people in there. I know that they shared some numbers on the amount of people they had there, you know, all together at the same time. And it was uh, some groundbreaking numbers. While still small, let's say from a Hollywood perspective, uh, there were still numbers that were very, very relevant um, and important for us to pay attention to. Um, I would say, what are some of the most, you know, some of the most fun experiences I've had so far? Um, I, I did, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the Steve Aoki concert in Oculus Venues, um, because it was a wonderful experience. I went in there and I was in the concert with three of my friends and we had a great time. We danced all night and it truly felt like we were in person. We even, you know, and I, and I don't want to bring controversy into it, but we even had an experience where so, one of the avatars uh, next to, not next to me, but next to the person next to me was doing strange movements, was doing something, was just doing something that wasn't right, didn't feel right. And we wanted to report him, but then he left and, and we didn't get a chance. So, but it felt, um, it felt real, right? It felt real that it was this moment of contra like, of conflict in, in that wonderful experience anyway. So um, I love that one. I think Dr. Crumb's uh, Disobedient Pets, and I know they're doing some great things uh, that they have lined up for the future of that, um, of that experience. And one of the ones that actually impacted me a lot was Darkfield, Darkfield Radio, which is audio. Uh, 
and you know normally I tend to be a very visual person but uh, I you know I got a chance to experience and it's an all audio experience now um, that you can do at home uh, during the pandemic right and I was blown away um, it's a little bit creepy uh, and I literally had to take my airpods out at one point because I was like this is way too way too realistic audio like I cannot handle this so so I would say that those are some of the experiences that I've had that are just truly um, that have been a lot of fun really Great. And I know I've had so much fun in uh, virtual worlds this year and I could have never imagined it. But um, obviously we built our virtual world for Venice um, this year. It was super fun constructing it. I spent hours inside it having, you know, one day I think I was eight hours um, wandering around, meeting people, doing fun stuff. And in fact, the most fun time I had was the eight hours I was in the closing night party. We built a special world for that. And Kent was with me and we went world hopping afterwards. Um, to loads of crazy worlds. I think we ended up in a Nordic uh, bar with a, one of the developers who just, we were with Jason from VR Chat, who's a community manager, and he introduced us to a whole lot of people and we jumped from world to world. So Kent, tell, tell, tell us what you've been doing and where you think this is going. Yeah, well, I, so this year I've been focusing a lot on like virtual conferencing and really asking the question of like the art of gathering. What's it mean to gather I spent a lot of time at conferences kind of roaming in the interstitial in between places, having these serendipitous collisions. Um, and I think probably the closest that I've run into that virtual recreation was at Burning Man, uh, the Black Rock City VR and alt space. And I think in terms of the art and what was created there, it wasn't the best art that I've seen, but what was unique was that it was like over 200 artists had created with the same template. So there's a, a coherence of going from world to world, but also an entire culture from Burning Man with their 10 principles. And so what's it mean to start to bring in these outside communities that have a long history of trust and culture that they've cultivated and how do they translate that culture into the virtual world? Uh, and so for me, that, that's probably one of the most interesting things that I've seen this year. Uh, and I have a number of interviews that I'll be uh, airing and I have aired uh, that I'll be digging into that more. Um, but I think generally what I see is that in the pandemic that we've, we've been seeing in, in the VR chat has been seeing an, an increase of these virtual interactions and trying to translate, you know, like Scarecrow was at Sundance and now it was a translation for Raindance. Um, you have um, Maria from the, the curator of Raindance did a whole curation of virtual chat worlds as a part of the uh uh, competition. So you have like horror games like The Devouring, where it's like a five to seven hour game where you you have no way to save. And so you have to actually play through all the way. Uh, but you can like have friends kind of pop in. You can have one person who can do uh, one of the tasks. You can split up. You could stay together. Um, so like having that social dimension within the context of that game, uh, I'm starting to see a lot more of that. And there was a, an a immersive art piece called Moringa, where the artist Dirk had spent two and a half years creating all this immersive art. And he took us on a guided tour that was an hour long. And it was like, we didn't even see everything. And so just thinking about what's it mean to guide people through a world uh, and you know things like the virtual market that was in VR chat is another thing that's worth checking out just in terms of the vastness of world building and, and what's happening in commerce. But I, I do see that there's gonna be a, a continuation of the, the blending of these different contexts so the games into the uh, world building, the exploration and, um, and yeah, for, for me, uh, you know, some of the other highlights, uh, Meta Movie was an experience where I'm the protagonist of, of a movie so that, and, and I was able to, to, to kind of do this live action role play. You have um, the, uh, the Under Presents and the Tempest where you have live immersive theater actors that were hired to be able to, to create this world. So to blending like the performative aspects of art uh, and performance within the context of these VR worlds, but have the VR worlds actually be like these dreamscapes that you can kind of do this little mini world hopping within the context of that world. And so I do see a, a future where uh, we're going to be moving more into the metaverse and just, you know, a, a final thought about the metaverse is that you have the closed walled garden where everything is being incubated, but eventually the, the metaverse is going to be open and interchangeable. We're going to be eventually, hopefully be able to go from one world to the next and maintain your own avatar and all your friend networks and have a persistence of being able to jump between alt space and VR chat and, you know, rec room and, you know, Facebook horizon right now, that's completely not possible. But uh, if we look into the future, we're going to see a lot of the 
web XR technologies and open XR that starts to create more open standards uh, where people can more jump in between different contexts and kind of break out of those walled gardens. And I think there's experiences like VR chat that are really showing like what's possible in terms of the different types of social interactions and, and, and type of avatar representation. And then the next question is, okay, now how do you like transfer that? Uh, is that the economic business model for that entity so that there's going to be an incentive to not allow you to uh, move out? And then what is going to be the kind of from the people, the bottom up metaverse creation so that you have these open websites where you're able to have more of these different behavioral interactions? Absolutely. And I think, you know, what's a, one of the things that's really important you brought up was actually the revenue models, because um, we're still really early on. So the under presents is a really interesting model because it's a kind of open ended game that exists already that they've used to create a live performance with actors that you experience with other people. Um, and I think it's a really good example of what you can do within a ward garden or within an app that exists. But I think that's going to be the real issue is how we start generating revenue. Um, so it's still quite early on still. I wanna move on now to digital avatars. Um, and you know, we're talking about business models. I totally agree with you. One of the things I noticed after spending a lot of time in VR chat was I really care what I look like <laughs> in my virtual environment. And it's kind of exciting, that idea that you can be anybody. Um, and you know, there's a whole public uh, library in VR chat. It's a lot of uh, you know, cartoon characters. And if you're a woman and you wanna be represented as a woman, you, there are manga characters. And when I started going deep inside, you know, I found Final Fantasy worlds, which had great avatars. You can start constructing your own avatars and sites. You can sort of build something in $10. It's quite basic. Um, that's one thing about being embodied. Um, as yourself, you started talking about um, making representations on holograms of your of real people. What? How far are we away from digital versions of ourselves that become autonomous? Um, yeah. So I'm going to start with um, with Kathy because you started to sort of touch on that. Well, I think there's company, I mean, there's organizations like the AI Foundation, the AI Foundation is doing some really interesting work in that end. And, you know, kind of finding those, you know, <laughs> AI driven versions of ourselves. Um, and, you know, the whole premise for them is that we should, everyone should own their own AI, right? No, it should not be owned by anyone else. It should be owned by themselves. So I think that there, there's interesting work. Um, I think for me, like, the types of the type of historical preservation I'm thinking through is not necessarily AI driven. It's more like true preservation of those stories and, and the people and the languages and the dances and you know eventually even endangered endangered animals um, if if you know if that's possible in the future, right? Um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I think you bring up a really good question. I'd love to hear Kent's opinion on this. Uh, well, there's two parts. The one part is the avatar re representation, which I think is you know, just, you know, finding ways that you can express your identity through kind of trying on different clothes and experimenting with your identity expression based upon your embodiment, which I think is distinctly different than the other part of that question, which is around the autonomous aspect of AI agents. And I'm going to be very provocative and I'm going to say, we're never going to get there ever. And I think the reason why is because we're not closed mathematical formulas. We don't, we can't predict what our aspirational aspects of our consciousness are gonna be in the future context of what is happening in the world. We are complex nonlinear beings that are open and relational. We can't ever, ever, ever reduce that down into an algorithm or a digital representation, let alone it having some sort of agency and autonomy and free will. And I don't know if we could do that, if I would even want that. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about sort of in jest that we wanna clone ourselves, but, really how closely could you really clone yourself when your expression of your identity is something that's emergent uh, based upon the relationships and the context that you're in. And so I don't think that's necessarily like a good goal to even try to go towards, but I think we can do is try to think about AI not as being like this autonomous God, but more of like this helper that is looking at our patterns of behavior and maybe helping to predict some of the future things that we can do so that we can maybe see all these invisible things that we're doing and, and be able to reflect upon it, but in collaboration with us as an autonomous entity on, uh, amongst ourselves that we're gaining insight from the AI, but it's helping us to achieve other goals. And so 
um, I think there's a risk of kind of talking about AI in, in the terms of super intelligent beings. And you tend to like start to put AI as the God where human beings become into service of these entities. But at the end of the day, we're humans where we should be at the top of that food chain. And, and we should do everything we can to try to mitigate that power differential where we already have out of control rogue AI that's you know dictating and shaping our lives and creating filter bubbles of reality that are already kind of tearing the fabric of our society apart. So like we already are like way too far. And so we kind of, if anything, need, need to rein that back in and be in deeper relationship to thinking about what the final cause is. Like, what is the intention? What, why are we creating it? What do we want to achieve? What do we want to do? And if we align that to being in relationship and helping to serve humanity rather than, you know, creating uh, a way in which the AI sort of uh, puts everybody out of a job and, and it, it sort of enriches a, a couple of, uh, a handful of big mega tech corp corporations that are in charge of everything. So we need to move more towards like this transparency, openness and empowering of our individual humanity rather than trying to uh, strive towards anything that is going to be fully autonomous. And then Liz, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for people to go listen to that episode of Kent's podcast. That that was just, I mean, such a, I, I don't know. I don't even have words. I mean, I was, I, I, I yeah, I, that's, I think, you know, I don't, I haven't really listened to Kent's episodes twice, but this is the one episode that I listened to twice. It, it's I was a like, fantastic, I'm to that again. It's a fantastic yeah. episode. Um, mm -hmm. I did listen to it and I'm really impressed by the work you've done around ethics. Kent, what's the number of the podcast? Do you remember or found? Oh, uh, I yeah. have to look it up. Sorry. Um, fantastic. Because I, I was actually going to, um, ask you about sort of ethical uh, frameworks, but I'm really glad you both brought them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so episode 958, a candid conversation with Facebook's ARVR privacy policy manager. Um, and we reference uh, 951, which is a, a primer of, of privacy. Uh, so like, like uh, Kathy said, where she's been getting more into policy, I think that for me uh, as well, the deeper that I get into a lot of the, the tech and ethics issues, the more that I see that there's a huge vacuum for not having good frameworks or understanding for legislation to come in and help uh, figure out how to balance the power. Uh, and I think in that episode that we both are all referring to, and if people haven't uh, heard it yet, you know, we're, we're talking about within the next five or 10 years, having brain control interfaces that are able to uh, synthesize our thoughts into speech. And so it's literally able to read our mind and articulate our unspoken thoughts into uh, some sort of uh, artifact that could be listened to by not only Facebook, but also the government. And so we're moving into this world where it, it's going to have so much intimate information, biometric information, GAPA and skin response, our eye tracking data, and, and be able to reveal so much intimate information about ourselves. And from a story perspective, it's going to be amazing to be able to like have that depth of insight and to be able to potentially modulate and respond to how someone are, is dynamically going through an experience. But when you start to record that information and store it over long periods of time, then you start to get into all these ethical dilemmas, which is that the technology starts to understand us more than we understand ourselves. And you have this lack of fiduciary relationship with these big tech corporations that can start to control and manipulate us in ways that are way beyond our control. And so that's a, the, the big reason why I've been looking into ethics, did the F XR ethics manifesto as a big talk that tries to synthesize all the landscape of moral dilemmas. But also, I've uh, been working with the IEEE. Uh, they have an ethically aligned design, and they're going to be starting a new industry connections group that is going to be bringing people from across the industry. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that every uh, industry and domain has insights to add to uh, VR. So you could look at something like therapy and counseling and how even within a virtual reality uh, context, you're going to have different therapeutic dynamics that you're a game developer, so you're not like a member of the American Psychological Association fully ramped up on all the ethical implications of doing therapy. But there are, are going to be different ways in which that the frameworks from these different disciplines are going to be needing to be fused into like this meta framework for anybody that's doing anything in VR. And so that's, that's a, I think, a, a big uh, frontier in terms of not only understanding uh, how to fuse these th things together, but as storytellers, uh, taking a little bit of a black mirror approach of doing both the dystopic potentials to say, okay, here's how this could really go wrong, but also the more protopian and utopian potentials for 
how it would be like a exalted a world that has all the, the most uh, best implementations of how this all could play out in creating a world that we can actually step into as well. We can't just rely upon running away from fear. We have to have that aspirational and hope of how to really live into the most potential because you know technology is not neutral in the sense that it's only good or bad. It's a mix of both. And I think it's important for storytellers to, to not only explore the more you know dramatic aspects of the dystopic futures, but also the more uh, hopeful and uh, emergent uh, worlds that maybe don't have a, a traditional narrative structure, but allow us to be immersed within a positive vision of how this all could play out. I'm and so to glad you said that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. No, and to that point, it, he mentions BCI. I've been able to demo some of these technologies, some of these external devices, not internal. Um, I actually have one behind me, but one of the things that actually, that I walked away with was whenever I tried on any of these devices, my brain really, really likes it. And, and, and I, you know, I, I'm still sitting with that. I'm like, whether well, is this a positive thing? Is this a negative thing? I don't know. But like, just thinking of it, I feel like, you know, things lighting up in my brain. I'm like, I really want to go do that again. Um, so yeah, there, we, we're, there's going to be so many implications to walk through uh, in that sense. I think it's both, you know, interesting, you know, you're talking about the future printing press and Kent, you're talking about the idea that we have to come together, all these different sectors and work together. Um, because this printing press is not just about um, media, it's about so many other things. So I really love the way that your two presentations have come together. Um, I, before we wrap up, I just want to ask you a quick last question. Um, can you talk to us about the projects um, that you're really excited about? I know, Kathy, you've mentioned a couple of yours. Um, is there anything else um, that's coming up that you can think of or something that you know is happening? <laughs> I know a lot of things are happening. I can't really talk about them. Um, I'm, you know, I would say I'm, I'm excited to keep exploring uh, policy and, uh, you know, and having those conversations here in the United States and Capitol Hill. Um, H, you know, here in the United States, we had um, HR 4103, which was a bill that was introduced um, last time um, for help for exploring VR and AR to train uh, for professional development of federal employees. And that's going to be reintroduced in the new uh, in the new Congress in January. So I'm excited to to kind of um, see what happens with that. And, you know, I think that if those things are starting to happen at a federal level with employees, it's it, we have to start having these conversations about ethics and privacy now, not five years, 10 years on the line. So great. And Kent. Yeah, and for me, I continue to do the Voices of VR podcast, which is like a overly ambitious oral history project since 2014, where I've uh, published uh, over 900 interviews, but I've recorded over 14 to 1500 interviews. So about two thirds of all the stuff I've recorded, I've published. And so uh, it's a constant struggle to to both cover what's emerging, but also dig into those archives and keep putting stuff out. So I have a lot of stuff um, from film festivals that because of the lack of distribution, it, it's like a, an ephemeral performance that happens. And then you were there and you saw it or you didn't. And so that's a constant struggle for me is that uh, to be covering this space when it's so inaccessible for most people in the industry. And I, what I am hopeful for is seeing new ways in which that with the global pandemic, there's been ways in which that I could uh, watch this content remotely, but also just the larger community has been able to watch it as well. Uh, so that's been interesting. My work in ethics continues with IEEE and as well as just, you know, getting kind of like these uh, interviews with like the Facebook privacy policy manager and really able to grill them on a lot of these really hard questions. I mean, I've been really frustrated that some of the biggest major tech companies have really been absent from this conversation. And so to just like start the conversation and to get them into the conversation and to have a broader conversation. And so just expanding that out with more and more people, uh, both on my podcast and uh, through webinars and the IEEE uh, initiatives. Um, and I'd say like the, the other things that I have in my back of mind that got me into this in the first place was to think about how to use VR as a, a communications medium that is like a memory palace of all space and time. That's like a, a thing that I think about a lot in terms of the, the spatial language of VR and what's it mean to be able to uh, express thoughts and experiences in ways that allow you to reflect upon your life 
And going back to my talk where, you know, VR in interactive story is a process of revealing your own character. And so how can you go into an immersive experience and then come out of that experience knowing something more about your own essential character? I think that at the heart is what this is all about. It's us growing and evolving and putting stuff out into the world and, um, you know, making art and making sure that our art is connected to the larger story. And if we go deep into our own personal story, then hopefully it'll tap into something that's universal that when other people see it, it'll stand the test of time. And I think what I try to do with my work in the Voices of VR is just try to get into these flow states and uh, emergent serendipitous collisions, capturing these conversations that are kind of capturing a moment in time. And then you know, having all these time capsules, now that I have like thousands of them, uh, how do you organize that into a spatial museum? Uh, so I, I start to think about a lot of these things um, and hopefully as I move forward, uh, doing more stuff with WebXR and starting to experiment with dynamic architecture and starting to do this type of visualization and what's it mean to build a memory palace of all space and time. Well, I'm excited to see what you do with Voices of VR spatially. Um, it's certainly an inspiration for me. I'm plowing through the hundreds of episodes and I've discovered so many things um, from your podcast. So thank you so much. Um, so unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up now. I could continue for hours. This is a totally fascinating conversation. So a huge thank you um, from us at Creative XR. Um, your presentations were excellent. This has been a brilliant discussion. Um, and um, I hope you get a chance to enjoy the projects. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. For those of you participating in Creative XR's Market and Showcase, we wish you engaging and fruitful meetings. We also hope you can join us today and tomorrow at our opening and closing events from 6 to 8 p.m. UK time in our virtual world designed by super talented company Vroom on the VR chat platform. Your journey to a fantastical London themed world where there be a very special comedy performance followed by a party. And for those of you who are watching this video after Creative XR Market and Showcase, please visit our website to find out more about the programme and the 20 projects we've supported this year. Goodbye and thank you for listening.